Hello, everyone. I'm Matthew Small, and I'm an engineering lead working at Google on the AR Core SDK for Unity. Uh, one of the primary functions of my job is to <clears throat> make a reliable and intuitive way for Unity developers to access the capabilities of AR Core. Today, I'm going to give you an overview of these capabilities and provide that AR Core provides developers uh, so that they can create immersive and captivating AR experiences from within Unity. I'll also mix in some tips to help you get started uh, using and developing with the AR Core SDK. So by the end of this talk, I hope that you are not only excited about using the AR Core SDK for Unity, but you have the tools to get started. And if my slide will go next, there we go. So I'm going to start with one fundamental question. Why AR? Or <clears throat> more specifically, why is now the time for mobile device-based AR? And why are such experiences worthwhile for developers to create and for users to consume? One reason why right now is the time for mobile AR is that consumer mobile devices have recently reached a point where they're powerful enough to integrate compelling AR experiences into everyday flows. Think of the common hardware sensor suite that mobile, develop, mobile devices have to offer. You have <clears throat> the color camera, GPS, accelerometer and gyroscope, a proximity sensor, the list goes on. In many ways, AR is providing virtual sensors that aggregate data from these hardware sensors to provide a high-level sensor feed for the world around the user. Like, we aggregate the color camera to produce light estimation. We aggregate color camera and IMU data to provide motion tracking. It's only because of advancements in mobile device performance that we can now provide these computationally complex virtual services at parity with the hardware sensor suite that exists on devices today. More important than just the capability for developing mobile AR experiences is the value of doing so. At Google, we believe that mobile devices seeing and understanding the world in a similar way to the way that human beings see and understand the world is a fundamental paradigm shift in computing. As developers, that means you have the opportunity to leverage this understanding to bring content to your users when it's contextually relevant and delightful. AR allows developers to fundamentally blur the line between the real world and the digital one. And we're really just beginning to scratch the surface on the utility of AR. By leveraging spatial understanding, users can perform accurate measurements or access and manipulate a range of products right there in their own space. And of course, AR is fun. We have example after example of AR games and experiences that are a lot of fun. And AR has been used to tell stories, play games, spice up video, or just to make whimsical and delightful user experiences. Now let's talk about the technology behind these experiences. AR Core is Android's, I'm sorry, <clears throat> <laughs> AR Core is Google's platform for developing excellent AR experiences at Android scale. And let's talk a little bit about what that scale is, right? Android has 2 billion active devices in the hands of users. Of those 2 billion, AR Core is supported on over 200 million of those devices. And I think that's a really compelling marketplace. Also, we're continuing to certify more devices each and every day. 
2018 has been <laughs> an exciting and busy year for AR Core. At the beginning of the year, we, we launched our first full release, and we've had four iterative releases since. Re and those releases provided refined motion tracking, wider device support, and fresh capabilities like augmented images and cloud anchors. So let's look at some of these capabilities and how to start leveraging them in the AR Core SDK for Unity. There are three things that you need to begin developing for AR Core in Unity. First, you need an AR Core device, a, a device that supports AR Core. Second, you need Unity Editor 2017.4 or higher. And lastly, you need to download and import the AR Core Unity SDK package into your project. From there, enabling basic AR functionality with motion tracking and camera pass-through is as easy as dropping a single prefab into your scene, flipping a couple settings, and clicking build. So what devices are actually supporting AR Core? Here's a comprehensive list of them that's current as of today. As I mentioned, together these devices represent about 200 million devices, and we're adding more every day. And anytime you want to see the current list, as always, you can find that list, quick start, uh, reference documentation, downloads, and more at our developer website, developers.google.com slash AR. <clears throat> and uh, so now that we've covered the prerequisites, why don't we look at developing, uh, developing in AR Core with Unity? So one of the first fundamental uh, capabilities that AR Core provides is motion tracking. And AR Core uses visual inertial odometry to perform motion tracking. This sounds kind of like a dense phrase, but maybe let's break it down. First, we have visual, which means that AirCore scans each camera frame from the color camera for visually distinct features and compares those features to features found in the previous frame. By looking at the relative movement of those features, we can, uh, we can estimate how the device has moved through space between those two color camera images. Second, inertial. AR Core fuses data from the device's IMU, the accelerometer and gyroscope, to refine this pose estimation and provide a smoother experience. Lastly, odometry pretty much just means motion tracking. So the term visual inertial odometry means motion tracking that's primarily based from the color camera image and aided by the IMU. The result of this process is a position and orientation estimation for the device each frame of the Unity application in the physical world. So this is how we support motion tracking in the AR Core SDK for Unity. On this slide, we see the AR Core device prefab. And <clears throat> let's go through the components of this prefab to see how it's able to mirror real-world movement of the physical device in Unity's game scene. So the first component we see is the transform component, obviously providing a position, rotation, and scale in the Unity game scene. The second component we see is a camera that renders the virtual objects from the physical uh, camera's perspective. And the third is a tracked pose driver. And what that does is reads the pose estimation from AR Core each frame and then applies that to the attached game object's transform so that it can properly mirror that pose estimation, that position and rotational estimation of the device in the virtual game scene. The last thing you see is the AR Core background renderer component. 
So for AR, we usually want to render the color camera behind our virtual scenes. And this is what this component is responsible for. It's going to render the color camera as a background to your virtual scene using the material supplied and adjust the frustrum of the sibling camera component so that your virtual objects match the proper scale for the device's physical camera frustrum. So we conven conveniently place all these components on the first camera, first person camera game object that's part of this AR core device prefab. And the prefab also handles life cycle for AR core, uh, as well as AR core configuration and asking for camera permissions. So we've set it up or we've tried to set it up so ultimately developers can use this one prefab to get up and running with AR core at lightning speed. The next capability that I'm going to talk about in AR core is lighting estimation. AR core lighting estimation calculates an intensity and color correction for ambient light from the physical environment in each frame. So this enables developers to better match the lighting of their models to reflect the lighting conditions of the real world and presume, uh, preserve the illusion of presence of those models in the physical environment. If lighting estimation is enabled in a session, then the AR Core Unity SDK is going to provide raw lighting estimation values each frame that can be accessed programmatically. So that's that intensity and color correction. But the easier way to access the, the lighting estimation is through the environmental light prefab. So what a developer will do to use this mechanism is drop the environmental light prefab in their scene, which is going to read those light, that lighting estimation data each frame and apply it to global shader constants that then the AR core shaders that we provide with the AR core SDK are able to take in each frame and apply to the model that you've attached that shader to. So that's that middle part of the slide. And you can write your own shaders around this as well using, using those values that are set by the AR core lighting prefab. The <coughs> developers uh, then can use the, the shader, like in this scene, to create happy plants. Another feature is environmental understanding, which attempts to understand the physical structure of an environment and present that information to developers in an intuitive way. This includes hor horizontal and vertical plane finding, as well as a feature point cloud that gives you sparse depth information about the environment that AR Core is running in. This can be used to place physical objects in the virtual environment or understand how to set up your game in that physical environment. So here's some code. They say never put code on slides, but I did. So uh, this is actually taken from our Hello AR example. And I just wanted to walk through really quickly to give developers in the room an idea of how you actually interact with the ARK, AR Core SDK for Unity. So <clears throat> what we're doing here is we're determining if a user's touch um, is clicking on a plane or an oriented point in the scene, or basically part of that point cloud. So I'm going to walk through it very quickly. Try not to have your eyes glaze over. If they do, I promise the pain will be over shortly. So the first thing we do is we set up a trackable hit uh, and a raycast filter. So in that raycast filter, we say that we want to hit uh, planes within a polygon and feature points with a surface normal. So a plane within a polygon just means that AR Core is trying to detect surfaces, planes. 
and we provide a polygon to outline the border of that surface. And by selecting this flag, we mean that when we cast a ray into the scene, if it intersects within that polygon, we want you to return that plane. The second part of the filter, feature points with surface normals, means that we want po points from the point cloud that have an estimation of their normal. So when we're making point clouds, sometimes we have really good feature points that we kind of know where they lie on the surface that we're detecting them on. And if that's the case, we'll return a normal. So you could call it a microplane. And we're essentially saying that we want to hit those two types of, of trackables. Then the if statement, we perform a ray cast with the touch position of the user on the screen. Uh, we provide that ray cast filter, and if we, if we hit something, then we go into that, that if. We then check to make sure that we didn't hit the back of it. I'll skip that. And then the else part is where we hit something, we hit the front of it, and we want to place an object. So we instantiate our Andy the Android model prefab at the position and rotation of the raycast hit on that plane or trackable point or, or feature point. And then we perform a rotation to correct for the model's rotation and attach it to an anchor. So we create an anchor at that point and then parent the Andy prefab to that anchor. And what an anchor does in AR core it says, I care about this location relative to the real world. So anytime you place an object that is based on real world information in AR core, you're going to want to use an anchor because AR core is constantly updating its understanding of the physical world and space. And to avoid your object from drastically moving when that updated understanding happens, you use anchors to, to say, I want to preserve this. So that wasn't so bad, right? Okay. Augmented images is another feature in AR core that allows developers to detect and track planar surfaces. This gives you the ability to trigger AR experiences off real world images, like taking a movie poster and bringing it to life. So how does it work in Unity? The first step is to select the images you want to detect. We have some editor GUI scripts that help out with this. You select the images, you right click on them, and via context menu, you can add them to a database. And this, this database of images represents images that you want to recognize in the real world. And this can be up to 100 images that are tagged with a name describing what the image is so that you can identify them later on. It'll also output a quality score to help developers deal with images that are not suitable for detection. The second step is to select the, to select, detect the image, I'm sorry. <laughs> and ARCore can look for uh, an image in a database of up to 1,000 and swap through databases if need be. The last step is to handle when an image detection occurs. The developer can recognize the image that was detected by the name that they gave it in the database, and then attach 3D assets to the trackable that's returned. So they place an anchor on the image, as I said before, you want to anchor anything that you want to stay relative to something in the real world, and then they can place their 3D assets on that. So this is a picture of the, an augmented image database in the Unity Editor. So we have in the scene hierarchy, or I'm sorry, the project hierarchy selected an example database. And then in the inspector, we see that example database with several images on the screen. As you can see, we provide a name, an optional field that the developer can 
uh, can supply to give additional information about the size of that image in the real world that can improve tracking, and then we return a quality score for that image. So all these images are, are example images that are shipped with the SDK, so of course they're all 100 out of 100, they're perfectly tracked augmented images, but a developer may try and use something like an almost completely black texture or a completely white texture or something that just doesn't have enough features to track well, and we wanna return information about that. And obviously we have a little preview of each image, and then at the bottom we have the uh, session configuration, if we recall that AR core prefab uh, that we, AR core device prefab that we looked at previously, that has a field for a configuration object, a scriptable object that provides a configuration. And this is that object, and if we want to use a certain augmented image database, we set it here. If we want to change that at runtime, we change the configuration at runtime by linking a different augmented image database to this session configuration. A really awesome feature for creating uh, multiplayer AR experiences is Cloud Anchors, and it's relatively new. It allows one device to specify a real-world location and then share that real-world physical location with another device. So, I'm talking about this place here, and then I tell the other device about that, and that device knows, yeah, I get it, you're talking about right here, physically. And that's very powerful, obviously, for creating multiplayer experiences. This means you can now also create experiences that work across Android and iOS, because the Cloud Anchors feature in AR Core also works with the AR Kit SDK. So let's take a quick look at this video that is an application called Just Align that uses uh, Air Core Cloud Anchors. I feel like there's sound. Can someone hum maybe a little bit? Yeah, it's already got some. It's okay. It's okay if we don't have sound. It's not the end of the world. Technical difficulties. <laughs> and now you guys see what I see. <laughs> Would anyone like to finish the presentation for me? And back. Expand. So anyways, this is a really cool video. It has sound. The idea, let me explain it instead. So, yeah, you need that music or else it doesn't make sense. So this is a high level view of how cloud anchors work. Device one explores an area and creates a cloud anchor. This uploads environmental understanding data 
to the Cloud Anchors API, and device one will receive a unique identifier for that Cloud Anchor. Device one then shares that unique identifier for the Cloud Anchor with device two. This can be done with Unity Networking, Firebase, or really any communication mechanism that the developer wants to use. Device two then asks to resolve that Anchor ID from the Cloud Anchors API, and it will be given a local anchor in its tracking space that matches that same physical location. So this is um, an application that was also created with Cloud Anchors called Lightboard. So we're creating a game, and one player is hosting an anchor here, and then starting the game, and then the other, and the other player is going to resolve that anchor, and they have a similar idea of the physical layout and where that anchor is positionally and oriented uh, and rotationally. And I'm missing slides. Awesome. OK. And <clears throat> then I have another video of Cloud Anchors. I'm sorry, rather, uh, Augmented Images. And this is an augmented image gallery. And it's similar to what you find outside that we had at Google I.O. And again, what's happening here is the application is detecting the augmented image and then overlaying a, a virtual object with maybe some occlusion and things over, over that to make a really kind of cool and unique experience. And then because I like to always give a little behind the scenes sausage making stuff, I brought this other video. Um, I was talking about visual inertial odometry earlier and how that tracks, virtual, tracks features in each camera frame and compares them to features in the previous camera frame. Well, we've been working on this a long time since like Tango. So we've got all sorts of crazy engineers running these kind of tests in all sorts of locations around campus and, and elsewhere. And we're in the San Francisco Bay Area. So this is a video of an engineer running our internal program for, for evaluating features on Lombard Street in, in San Francisco. So as you can see, we're detecting features each frame. And you can see the delta of these features as the motion tracking algorithm senses differences between frames. And hopefully this is the Lombard Street video. It might just be hanging around town. But either way, you get the same, the, the idea. Yeah, so that is it for me for today. And I'd like to thank everyone for coming. And ask you if you have any questions. So, yep. Hi. So I was just looking at the last video you showed here. So it's sort of showing you're doing some kind of mapping. So is that information also um, like being uploaded as an anchor to the cloud? So you have this in, uh, idea of the environment around you? Uh, so that mapping is used internally to track the fidelity of our measurements. So when we close loops, we want to see that if our estimation of relative movement came back and, uh, and, and uh, led us to the same position that we think we're in as we know we're in because we've done a loop. So mm -hmm. if I can ask one follow-up question then. Yeah. When you're uploading these cloud anchors, I mean, do you then 
do you just need to do it once because it already has a lot of, bunch of information but from the time history, or do you need, should you do it multiple times as you learn more about the environment? So you, each time you upload a cloud anchor, it's going to take information from the current environment at that point mm -hmm. and use that to, to host the cloud anchor. If you feel like maybe you, don't, you didn't have a great understanding or the application hadn't been running very long enough to gather good data about the environment, you can always re-host an anchor later. Thank you. Yep. Uh, yeah. So uh, my question is, is uh, Oculus Quest. I didn't see it on your compatibility list. I know it's running on Snapdragon 835 coming out next spring. Is it possible to use cloud anchors on Quest to create shared play spaces? So uh, I have to give a disappointing answer that like device support, if it's, if it's not on that page, uh, then it's something we're evaluating. Right. And we don't really give more information than that. And I'm sorry to, to give you a disappointing answer, but I'd probably be the wrong person to ask anyway. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are you planning to build Google, are you planning to support the selfie camera? Uh, on the back, on the front side of the phone, anytime soon. <coughs> I'll answer that with the fact that we have a new application called Playground that launched with the Pixel Three, that does do augmented reality on the selfie camera, and that is the only product that we've released that uses the front camera to date. Okay. Yeah, I had a quick question about the environment lighting. And uh, it looked like in the example you said you have shaders that will match the, the lighting environment. Have you tried experiments with actually generating like light sources within Unity so it works with any shader? No. <laughs> but that is, uh, that is a viable approach. It can be a little more co complex because you generally will want like more answer. positional data right. uh, about the light and it's, uh, it's light reconstruction versus estimation. Right. And mm -hmm. so since our, our lighting data is an estimation of the current lighting conditions and not a reconstruction of the lighting environment, I think that's less viable a solution if ever it advances to the point where we're doing a reconstruction of the, of the lighting in the scene, then I think that would, would be a viable approach. Cool, thank you. Uh, my question is about sensors, and um, just like personally, it doesn't have to be like from Google's standpoint, but just where do you see the future of sensors? Do you think depth is ever going to come back? Like, do you think RGB cameras going to be all we need? Are we going to have like RGB camera like offset of RGB cameras? Like, just personally, kind of, what's your philosophy? What do you think? Well, at Google, we've given this quite a bit of thought. I was around in the Project Tango days. And obviously, at that point, we had <clears throat> structured light sensors or time of flight sensors on all our devices that supported Tango. And uh, those sensors can enable abilities such as 3D reconstruction of environments that are tougher to reach when you don't have that additional sensor suite. But there's a lot of limitations as well. So I think as AR becomes more available in more platforms and on more devices, you'll see experimentation around the value proposition for additional sensors. And basically, if, if companies and individuals demonstrate a compelling use case and need for those type of sensors and support for those type of sensors, and I think the market will follow. Yeah, that makes sense. Thanks. How long do cloud anchors persist? Our guarantee for cloud anchor persistence is the life cycle of the session. How long do they actually persist? <laughs> like, uh, like up in the cloud. Yeah, yeah. So our guarantee is for the life cycle of the session. And I'll allow you to experiment and see, you know, what you can what you can squeeze out of them. 
Cool. We're not going in and changing it every day, so probably you can rely on whatever you get. Uh, hi, uh, my question about was about the image detection, the augmented image example. Uh -huh. So most of these, the ones I saw were like flat facing towards you. Yep. What about like diagonal ones, like which are not like straight 90 degrees? So to, to inject some terminology here, we detect planar surfaces. Okay. So arbitrary planar surfaces with mm, visually distinct features would be like the most generally way, general way to say it. Now, if you can, you can take that planar surface and orient it just about any way, and we'll be able to detect it. Okay, so you can just let it just train, change the training data for the image. It's not even the, if, if it's, if you're able to view the entire thing on a single plane, okay. and that's the only valid perspective, then, then we can detect it. Okay, thank you. Yep. Maybe this question was answered with the life cycle question, but. Uh, for augmented images, uh, it only works for real images, right? I can't make a social media post and say, point your camera right here, and it'll just work, right? Uh, that is not right. So it does work. You can do that. Oh, so I could uh, make a social media post, and like 10 days later, someone could just point their camera at that post, and it'll work? You can make a social media post that has an image on it and the person can point their, their device at a screen and it will detect that as an augmented image okay. in, the, in the correct, if you've done the setup correctly. Okay, cool. Yep. Uh, this is kind of a general question as to AR itself, but I mean, good to ask Google about this at least first. Um, but I'm kind of curious, uh, as far as AR technology, if uh, you guys in the back, uh, um, like you engineers, have actually thought about um, tracking a little bit more than visible light, and if you're going on this uh, as beyond our visible light spectrum, possibly infrared or uh, ultraviolet and stuff, and possibly, I mean, other supernatural levels per se. And <laughs> that's it's such yeah. a yeah, but like <clears throat> like detecting. Auras and <laughs> chi and chi and karma. Mm. Yokai. Yeah, I think that probably falls in the bucket of additional sensors, right? Because it, <laughs> it wasn't. I wasn't joking. <laughs> I think uh, yeah, not the not the chi and the karma stuff, but the, as far as you know, de detecting infrared and 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 things like that because the, the color camera sensor or the, the camera sensor will have to return that data at a hardware level, right? Yeah, 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 so, yeah, yeah. I, I get that, but have you guys actually thought about um, implementing, because I know that uh, infrared, they're using infrared cameras for like face detection and stuff uh, across different phones. Um, so yeah. now that those are starting to get onboarded, I mean, what, have you guys th thought about yeah, I think, so, adding so, more sensors to the phone to support something like that? So whenever you're adding more sensors, you're fragmenting your support. So we don't, we don't uh, in, in terms of we have a feature that works with this additional sensor, either our whole plugin doesn't work with phones without this feature, or you can't count on phones that have AR core to run every feature that AR core uses, right? So you're fragmenting that. And I, I'm just giving you the, the thought process that we have when we look at things like supporting additional sensors. So I think if that proves to be a, a really viable use case, then there's definitely a possibility of, of adding, adding support. Yeah, but yeah, I think we're, we're super critical about, you know, do we really, d does this add such value that we want to add some fragmentation or, you know, can we wait? Yeah, it's just the question now is like, it, what if that wasn't a block? I mean, what if you guys were allowed to think in that space? Yeah, I mean, I would like to support everything and anything and I, I'd like to detect karma and chi and um, I would like it to give tarot readings and, <laughs> I mean, of course, yeah, I, I think that's, uh, there are probably compelling things, night vision, for example, that can, that can be enabled in that mm -hmm. sense, and uh, I think 
there are compelling use cases. But I think it's for the experimental round for realm for now, and the more scalable stuff, we're going to leave the core. Thanks. Yeah. Great presentation, just a very quick question. Um, when you had that image with the actual painting, there was a bit of depth to that. Are you generating any occlusion data or are you just using the stencil buffer to kind of mask what you see behind? The latter. Okay, thank you. Yep. Awesome. So I think that's all the questions and we're time. Thank you very much.